Introducing our 72nd inductee is Eric Volker. Eric's the two-time NCAA champion and a three-time All-American at Iowa State. Why in the world do they pick guys, you know, who never win a state championship? 
Oh, you know, how'd they ever see this guy? Well, it was through the summer wrestling program, hooked up with Dowling, and you know, dad drove me 15 miles and took one workout with him. A lot. You know, days I didn't want to. But, uh, that's where the exposure came, and it was through junior, the state freestyle tournament, junior nationals, hooking up, getting to know people like uh, Joe, uh, Jeff Gibbons, roommate, friend of mine, teammate of mine at Iowa State, Tim Krieger, these guys who really excelled in high school. And here's another little point for the younger guys. If, if you want to get known, you got to get around the guys who are known. Okay? And, I mean, there's some strategy involved here. Let's be smart about it. But more than that, it's not just about getting around them. It's about becoming like them, which is going to lead me into probably one of the most important events that happened to me in Iowa State. And it happened toward the end of my first year. Because I really wasn't in the in crowd yet, I, I was earning my way in in the practice room. Socially, I, you know, I knew Jeff, I knew Tim, but, you know, I hadn't wrestled with them in the summer for four years like they had. So I, I wasn't in yet. I, I was beating the guys in the room which was a better deal, but, you know, I wanted the other part, too. So how, how do you do it? And, and one day, you know, I think Jim recognized this. Uh, oh, you know, midway through the year, he sees me beating the guys they recruited ahead of me. They quit. I get their money. You know, that was, was a good deal. There's another tip for the guys. Uh, you win, you get some money, okay? But Jim took, you know, he, he called me over one night and he said, hey, after practice tonight here, uh, come with me. And so we went over to Taco John's just, you know, across the street from Fire Hall where we worked out. And we sat down, and of course, my knees were shaking, you know. What's he going to do to fire me? You know, is this the end? But what he really did was sat me down and really connected me. I was connected in some ways before with the vision of Iowa State of developing national champions being national champions and, and being successful, but not in the way that I needed to be yet, that was growing. And so he takes me there and, you know, I'm going to say that we both paid for our own because of my kind of recruiting violation. I'm going with we paid for our own for now. Yeah. <laughs> That's my story and I'm sticking to it. So we're sitting down and, and Jim says, you know, this and that, this and that. And finally he gets down to the heart of the matter, why I'm there. And he tells me, you know, Eric, and actually, you know, my name at Iowa State was Polk. Uh, they dropped the two letters off the end. I didn't care. Uh, you know, I'll take it. He says, Volk, I want to tell you this. He says, Iowa State has always had great teams that are built around a leading a good 190 pounder. Okay, there comes a, there's a five pound plate on my head. The pressure's mounting. And, and, and he went on talking about this and, and how he, he was placing in me the vision that he knew I needed to have become the person that, that he knew I wanted to be, the accomplishments that I wanted, and also the things that, that matched up there with, with the Iowa State program and the teammates. And so, you know, by the end of that half hour, whatever it was, uh, meeting, what he had really done for me was focus me, not just on working out to working out, for working out, but the purpose of working out in terms of uh, always being consistent with reaching my goal, which he knew was being a national champion. It was my goal. But it really solidified for me that night, not just that I was beating the guys in the room, but now that, because I knew that that would happen, that was my conviction. But what it was a real, uh, I guess, plus, or uh, it drove the point home for me now that the program was beginning to recognize me in that way. And so I accepted the responsibility of being a team leader, even as a freshman. Now, the other guys didn't yet see me that way, but this is what Jim was talking to me about. If you want to be like these guys, and Dave Ewing makes re uh, reference to it earlier, you've got to find out with these guys that have what you want and start copying what it is they're doing. You know, uh, social life, academic life, uh, athletic life, every area. Like, like Dave said, he's looking at Joe. And so you can see the repetition in what happened here. Dave's looking at Joe saying, if he's uplifting the six, I am too. For me, if they were uplifting the six, I might have been here seven. <laughs> which, which is a funny point. You know, the last couple of years I was there, I, I, I had an aversion to morning practice. And uh, Jim handed that off to Ed because uh, I think he recognized how difficult that was in getting me there. 
But that's another piece of the pie that as I got better and Jim knew that I was seeking to become the absolute best wrestler I could, I knew that he had his best interest was also the same. Mine was personal, his was not only for his personal goals to be a great coach, but also to develop the team and become the championship. So, which, back to the original intro, intro and Jim choosing me to do this for him, when he first asked me, I, you know, my fear of course came up and I'm like, why me? I mean, we didn't have what, what you would probably consider a very friendly relationship through my five years at Iowa State. But, the, but I, I start with the story of Taco John's, or, I don't even know if it was Taco Bell. I can't remember if they had the Chihuahua there or not. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, the, the point is, and I'm going to finish up here in just a second, is, you know, I, I have this whole few pages. Jim, Jim cut me down to this. <laughs> Along the way, athletes and coaches know what it is they want. And the closer they get to it, I think the tighter it is that they cling to the way they want to do it. And, and having such great success early in my third year at Iowa State winning the national championship, uh, it really focused me on myself. <laughs> you know, 20 years old, Superman on the chest. You know, what, what do I need a head coach for? And, the next couple of years, that really was, was my viewpoint on things. But what I realized after getting out of Iowa State was that even though Jim was after me all the time, uh, we didn't have a lot of friendly conversations. Joking around a little bit, but, you know, I didn't seek him out. He didn't really seek me out on road trips to shoot the breeze. But we did seek each other out in a very business-like, I guess, uh, relationship in the struggle to get better and become champions because it's what we both wanted realized that and that's where we got along. It really wasn't until, he, if he would have called me a year or two out of Iowa State and asked me to do this, I probably would have said no. But it's the time that moves on that allows me to look back and see the reasons why he would choose me now. Because as a coach, his job was not to be friendly to me. It was to help me get what he knew I wanted and even more than that. And he did that for me and he did it for a lot of other guys. So I just, uh, just a, a few stats here, you know, Jim was a three-time uh, state champion as an athlete. You know, I'm up on the internet last night, I'm going to please, if I'm going to talk about Jim, I better know what he did. <laughs> I'll be honest, I thought he won twice. So he, won, he wins three, three-time All-American, national champion at Iowa State. He wins a team title in 1987. A lot of people might say, well, that was with the next team. No, it wasn't, because Jim Nick was grooming, training Jim for head coaching, and I, I don't know if it was for Iowa State, his original intent, was, or whether it was for anywhere. But knowing Nick, he was going to be a head coach somewhere, because Nick was interested in uh, bringing people out into wrestling. So is that Nick's team? No, because Jim was heavily involved in the recruiting process, and in many ways, when he stepped in at 26 years old at Iowa State University, in some ways very unqualified, in many ways very qualified, uh, trained and coached by one of the best ever, um, and, and, and willing to do what it took to win. He got the people around, he kept Joe around, uh, he got Ed Manning over there who, you know, fundamentally was probably the biggest instrument in my getting better at Iowa City. You know, it's kind of sad when you uh, come out of a wrestling room, you can beat the freshman, but you can't score a point anybody else for at least the first semester you're there. You know, Joe talks about coming out of there crying. I was crawling out, besides crying. It was tough, but the thing is, you know, Jim created the environment. He, he saw what Nick did, he duplicated it, he made it better in ways he knew how. Uh, he learned, and, you know, he won the national championship to continue here. He won the team title, he, he produced the seven NCAA champions, of which I'm totally honored a lot of the credit for giving me two of those. Uh, 32 All-Americans, uh, you know, that's production. But it's more than just a, a number, it's more than production. What that, what that in, 
built, what, where that comes from is meetings like Taco Bell. It comes from him sitting, you know, uh, 14 years later, by chance, we're at the same tournament down at I-35, South Point in Truro, Iowa, the Saturday High School Tournament. I don't know if it's sectionals or districts. And uh, we're talking about recruiting, and he tells me, you know, because I'm, I'm wondering why, they, even, even now, sometimes I'm wondering, how do you get it? person like me, not the all-star. And Jim tells me, you know, just, we heard it before, it's a numbers game. You recruit the best that have already got the titles, you know, 12 championships, and Joe did. But we also know a lot of guys in that recruiting field who have those titles that don't necessarily pan out and achieve again throughout the collegiate uh, career. So what Jim say, said to me, and, you know, we're looking at Iowa State, look at examining the program at the time under Bobby, and what Jen's saying, this philosophy basically was you recruit the best, you go with the stats, you, you go with the percentages. But the problem is, what if those guys don't work out? My freshman year, and Jeff knows this too, and Dave and, and uh, Joe, we had, I think, 20 kids in our recruiting class. So that's absolutely ridiculous. But the problem is you cast the net wide, and like Joe over here says, you heat up the room, you put a bar on the door, tell them to go at it, and then we'll come back and talk. And, and really, that, that's how they sifted me out and found me. And, and it's, a, it's a very successful way of doing it. And uh, it really produces uh, national champions. It's, it's a great way to find them. And, uh, you know, I speak from a personal note, uh, mostly from this. And uh, I really thank that uh, Jim for all he's done for me. And, uh, you know, you get a little soft and you can say that to me. I do, and it's, it's good to say it. And uh, I want to congratulate Bill, B, this community of Cresco, the Iowa State community, uh, now the Perry community, uh, Annie, Jenna, and Grace, uh, for all their involvement in making Jim who he is today. And I guess with that, I want to bring Jim up and uh, welcome him into the Iowa Hall. I just want to see what he'd say. <laughs> you know, it's it's a uh, it was a great experience. He, uh, I remember watching Aaron wrestle in the uh, state tournament his uh, senior year. The guys he took thirty, he only took twenty shots for one hundred eighty nine pounds at the time, and uh, uh, loses three to one. And he came back and said, "Gosh, you know, the guy just spun around him on one of those shots, and the guy stalled his butt off." So uh, I said, uh, you know, he wrestled a pretty good athlete. I said, we got to have that guy in the room. We just ended up, you know, I, I think the point I was trying to make with all of our great Iowa State teams that we had always had great 190 pounders. You look at Tom Pecco, you look at Ben Peterson, you know, you look at uh, Frank Santana when we won the national championship. You know, we had good upper weight guys because when you have a good upper weight guy like Pecco, the guy, lightweight guy doesn't want to make weight. They can hold the sauna door shut. <laughs> I got a kick out of my uncle Joe Frank. I mean, I've never heard him talk that much. <laughs> well, he holds one more record, and that's for sneaking as many nephews and nieces into the Minnesota State Fair. <laughs> he stuck 21 nephews and nieces into the State Fair one year, and, he, and I remember my dad had a big uh, camper. He put all the kids in the camper. Those two came through, and I think my dad paid, and then Joe got out and walked on the outside of the truck. <laughs> oh. But it's, a, it's, it's really a... Uh, man, what to think. You know, Joe gets up here, and everybody's walking to the bathroom. <laughs> but it's, it's really neat to be up here. You know, we talk about uh, uh, this part of the country, and I've just always been fascinated with it because, you know, we spend a lot of time here, as, uh, as uh, Joe was talking about earlier, and coming up here and spending time with, with uh, you know, Chuck, guys like Chuck Stevens and the uh, senior really all there. And it's, uh, the Stevenson family and the Kirby family are always really special to us. Uh, spending time up here as a kid. You know, Joe might have won four state titles, but he was 0-4 with that rooster. <laughs> he got it. 
guys might care. <laughs> It, it is absolutely an honor and so humbling to be here, and I feel so uh, uh, enthused about, you know, you look through that uh, Garrick was mentioning here, just the names that are, that are involved with uh, uh, this, and, you know, uh, I, was, I was talking to Jim Miller, who was one of your well-deserving inductees, and, you know, the great year that he's had at Warburg, and he got inducted here, uh, and, he, and he called me up, and, and uh, we were talking, and he said, is it that, you're going to be so pumped up about that, and when he was talking about Tom Rands being up here and saying that this is the... Hall of Fame that means the most to him, and it does for me too. Because just growing up as a kid, uh, uh, Joe, you know, went through our uh, traveling here that we went through, and I agree with him when he says that we were. Uh, uh, I always envisioned that someday I'd have this day, uh, but I thought it'd be in something like football, you know. But when I was 80 pounds as a seventh grader, even though I played like I was 95. <laughs> You know, just if Dad came up and I wanted to go out for basketball, or and he says, you know, look at the size of your mother, right? <laughs> you know, he wasn't any bigger than her. <laughs> he says, you are not going to be a basketball player. These guys are six foot tall. He says, you're never going to make it. You know, and you can work all you want, but you, you know, you, sometimes you got to work and work and work until you, you know, you find something you're good at. And wrestling is certainly that uh, way for us. Um, I, I want to thank the, the, the committee, and like I said, this is just a uh, you know, humbling uh, thing is that, uh, you know, I, I know that, that, that uh, Don Gooder, that since he started wearing black and gold, I, I thought this day may never come, you know. <laughs> Where is he? He's over there. Uh, yeah, he's back there, yeah, but it's, it's nice to have that feeling here to be included in this crew, you know, so and safe to be up here with my Uncle Joe and, and uh, you know, we learned a lot of wrestling from Joe Frank very early. Uh, just a few, just a handful of techniques. Joe mentioned the Fridley Ride. I think I had like 36 kids in high school or something like that, maybe three fourths of more with the Fridley Ride, which is a bar arm and you grab the rest of it and stack them up and then you, know, you take them over and figure for them. But it, it's still a great pinning combination today for high school. But, uh, but he also told us something else that was really important. He says, do not go ear to ear with somebody. Okay, I don't know if he really listened to that advice very well. But he says, don't go ear to ear with somebody, because if you go ear to ear, he's going to feel what you're going to do, even though you can feel what he's doing, you can't get out to be able to attack, right? So we, we kind of did everything forehead to forehead. And, you know, I don't have cauliflower ears right now, but, you know, I've got three broken noses, and th uh, three broken nose, broke my nose three times, excuse me. Have about six or seven chipped teeth. We have all kinds of scar tissue up here, and, and, and I go, you know what? I would have went with the ears. You know, <laughs> you know, it's worse than that. Is it that, that uh, you know, my my wife Annie and, uh, uh, has to sleep with me at night. You know, and that broken nose. <laughs> you know, it, it definitely would have went with the ears. All right. But uh, no, we were learned a lot of wrestling, and of course we learned uh, uh, we learned some uh, valuable lessons from our dad as, uh, as far as repetition. We learned how to drill and uh, to do the things, and, and uh, dad learned probably wrestling maybe just one or two steps ahead of us, and also always put us around in positions where we could succeed. You know, put us around great people, and that helped out. And, and Joe's description of our mother, uh, uh, you know, when I was coaching, people said, "What's it like coaching your younger brothers?" I said, well, not that hard at all. You know, when they get out of line, I tell my mama. You know, <laughs> but, you know, uh, it's it's uh, it's neat being up here with uh, these people. And you know, Joe was uh, uh, he's here. You hear that gig that he gave on me, um, Nick's last state champion crap. You know? <laughs> well, he had one year with me, and we didn't win. So I guess that, that must be coaching. <laughs> Uh, anyway, but I, I uh, just had a, uh, I, I was uh, around at the time uh, in wrestling at, at Iowa State, where, like Joe mentioned, it was King. I remember going to uh, the, the wrestling matches at the Armory, and I remember being at Dan Gable night. I remember when I was really uh, watching them take their 64, 65 nationals in the Armory. Uh, I remember, uh, uh, I think I went to the Oklahoma State match where uh, uh, Fazer pins Peckham and then hearing about it coming back and, and uh, I had to, I, I'm not gigging you, Tom, believe me, you're looking in great shape. All right. <laughs> I get my track shoes on. But uh, 
uh, just the, the history of Iowa State, just walking into that building, okay, you remember that smell, you remember the, 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 the cigarette smoke, the popcorn smell, and just that, uh, just that, that the steel bleachers and that, uh, how exciting that armory could be. I mean, we grew up in that type of environment and uh, crowds of 6,000 could sound like anything more than, uh, uh, than the 15,000 crowds if you're lucky to see one here in nowadays. But uh, it was a great environment to grow up in. And, you know, and that, that was, uh, uh, environment was uh, fostered and nurtured by you know, two great people. Uh, Harold Nichols, of course, your charter member. I remember seeing this plaque right here on Nick's uh, wall. You remember that, Les? I mean, he kept this in very high esteem on his desk. And he was a charter member of this organization, and that was right by his desk. I remember seeing that very vividly. And, of course, the other person here, which is a, a, a person that meant so much uh, to, to all the championship teams that we had at Iowa State, was there for all but one of them in 77 team. That's when he was out in Washington for a while. But, uh, great person at Les Anderson and having him around and, and uh, uh, Les was always in my corner quite a bit and I was a little bit of a slow starter and he always had these ammonia capsules that he would break off. And remember that Les? You know, I don't know if he used those sometimes but he himself but uh, the thing is is that he got me going. That was kind of our ritual before going out there at the map. My career, uh, I was a slow starter. I, I had a hip operation going in between my uh, senior and uh, freshman seasons, and it really slowed me down. It was very similar to the operation that uh, Mark Schwab had on his uh, uh, knee in uh, his uh, senior year. He had a staph infection, lost a bunch of weight. So I came back thinking I could make 118 weight, as tall as I am right now. It just wasn't uh, to me, so I kind of got scarred a little bit by the weight cutting process and didn't get off to a fast start. But I noticed that all the guys that I was going pretty well uh, with in high school, uh, guys like Randy Lewis, getting off to a fast start and fast track. That, that, that guy was really kind of my gauge. And if you have, uh, uh, you want to be, if you end up going to be a champion, that's what your goal is to be a champion. You want those opponents just to be as magnificent as they possibly can be. And I was really blessed with the weight class in 1981 that had some magnificent wrestlers. And uh, an Olympian made the, made the team in uh, 1980 in Lewis and a two-time national champion, Daryl Burley. I got beat 16 to 8 in the uh, dual meet, or actually, yeah, 16 to 6 in the dual meet uh, with Daryl Burley. And, and uh, I remember getting one of those smart aleck questions from Jim Lampley. You know, what are you going to do to win this match? Like, hey, we got to do this interview with this guy. He's going to get a butt pound in him, probably. So, what are you going to do? And my answer was the same thing. I'm going to score more points than him. And he thought I was being a smart ass to him. And I really was. And I was just trying to be honest with him. That's what I was going to do. And uh, it's, it's, it's once I understood that uh, you know you, it's more than just taking a guy down you can take great wrestlers down but it's it's, it's being able to keep up that pace and intensity uh, through a number of uh, uh, minutes of wrestling uh, is that, that what, uh, helps you become a champion so i didn't get off to a fast start but gosh darn it by the time i was a junior i was a national champion i really kind of got ahead of myself my goal is to become a two-time champion and mike land was one of the great wrestlers at iowa state back then and just a tremendous influence on us. He had a, a consecutive win streak of uh, 69 matches or something, some, some fantastic number. And Kale ended up breaking that streak whenever it was broke uh, in his career. But uh, he said one time, you know, I won the national championship, but it was a bigger thrill when we won it as a team. So that was always my biggest goal in, in, in the sport was to be able to do that. And we had great teams back then. So just I would have some just super teams to look back at. We had Olympians and, and uh, you know, multi-time Olympians. We just weren't able to get the job done. But uh, uh, that that goal of, of I had two goals: winning a championship in Ames, and I didn't end up doing that. It was my senior year. I think I kind of uh, choked a little bit, put a little bit too much pressure on myself. But I was about ready to leave, and Nick came back and, and asked me to uh, help out with the recruiting. And that's one uh, uh, really kind of great. Gave me a great opportunity to. Uh, to stay involved in the sport. I knew I didn't want to compete any further because I didn't really want to cut that much weight at the time. And uh, it gave me an opportunity to stay in the sport and uh, I was thankful for that opportunity. And once I got in there, it was just like I just decided to do the work. I didn't really care about you know what was happening. It was your, I had family in, in the program. When Jeff came into the program, that was, uh, you know, he had family that wanted to see them do pretty well. So my uh, uh, 
objective was just to try to get as good as become as good a coach as we can be, to have as good a program, to surround myself with uh, as good people as we could. On my coaching staff, we had uh, three guys that uh, actually two guys that, that applied for the job. You know, but we found a way to all make it work. We were uh, gentlemanly about it, and uh, the objective was the improvement of these these athletes, and, and uh, I think they certainly came through for us, winning the. Uh, uh, I'll, tell you, I'll, tell, I'll tell you a good story because it's, uh, it's, it's pretty important as far as my success. I told this the other day at over at Newton when Dan was there. Dan was here a little bit earlier, and uh, I really have a good time with him on this college broadcast. And, and the relationship with us has gotten a little bit better. But the first time I really got to spend a little bit of time with him is that Joe made it to the All-Star meet. And I was an assistant coach, and I applied for the head coaching job at that point in time, and, and it was probably about a month away before side in so uh, we go out there to uh, Logan, Utah at the flying to Salt Lake City. So I fly to Denver from Des Moines and Phil Hattie, who's the public address announcer in Iowa, was on the flight with Dan. And so at Denver we're taking the same flight to Salt Lake City. So we're kind of in the same immediate area, maybe across from each other in the aisle. We're talking to him a little bit. So they asked me as, as if, if I want to have a uh, Get a ride to Logan, Utah, which is a two-hour ride. I said, sure. So I hopped in there with them. So I'm the third guy in the back seat, just like the kid, the kids are. So I put, I said, well, this is my chance to start asking a question. So I had it two hours long in this uh, you know, a small car. Phil had him driving the gables on the, on the passenger side. So I put my elbows up here and I go, okay, how do you run your camps? How do you do your tryouts? Uh, what happened when King Mueller was the first team guy, and Jimmy Zaleski was the young freshman. And how did you make it so that Jimmy Zaleski was wrestling by the end of the year? And uh, what, what happened this whole process? So I asked him all these questions that I had from far. And for two hours, he's spilling his guts. You know, he's telling me everything it was about what, what was going on in his program. And uh, you know, he didn't think he didn't have any idea I was going to be getting that job in another month. Anyway, I see him at oh, the uh, state tournament, and I'm sitting about 18 rows up. And he comes running up the steps to me after I've been announced I was head coach, had to be the head coach at Iowa State. He runs up to me and goes, I told you too much. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I learned one thing about him is that uh, he will always tell you the truth. Isn't that right, Bob? Yeah, he'll always tell you the truth. But sometimes he'll run from you not to tell you the truth. But he's, he's, a, uh, he's really been an inspiration as far as we modeled a lot of our things that we did after, after what they were doing in the program.